Welcome to our C21 lecture featuring Bishop Robert McElroy from the Archdiocese of San Francisco. And as you know, the Church in the 21st Century Center is in its 10th year um, as a resource and catalyst for the renewal of the Catholic Church. My name is Eric Goldschmidt. I'm the director of the C21 Center. And tonight's event is part of our overall theme for this spring exploring the Catholic intellectual tradition, which extends out of our magazine, which many of you have seen, and if you haven't, you can pick up a copy in the back table. This afternoon, we're thrilled to have Bishop Robert McElroy to campus as part of our C21 Episcopal Visitor Program. Through that program, C21 hosts a bishop uh, for a day each semester um, on campus for a twofold purpose. One, for Boston College to share with a member of the hierarchy how it is fulfilling its Jesuit and Catholic mission. And two, for us to hear from a bishop how we can be of better service to the church. So Bishop McElroy has spent the day visiting with students, uh, with faculty, and with administrators and learning a lot about Boston College. And this evening he will present to you his talk, The Challenge of Catholic Teaching on War and Peace in the Present Moment. But first allow me to tell you a bit about his very impressive background. Bishop Robert McElroy is the vicar for parish life and development and, and an auxiliary bishop of the Archdiocese of San Francisco. He was ordained to the priesthood in the San Francisco Archdiocese in 1980. He has a BA in history from Harvard, a master's in history from Stanford, an STL from the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley, a doctorate in moral theology from the American College in Rome, and a PhD in political science from Stanford University. With that academic background, Bishop, you'll easily be mistaken for a Jesuit. <laughs> Bishop McElroy served as secretary to Archbishop John Quinn and vicar general of the Archdiocese of San Francisco. He was parochial vicar for two parishes and a pastor for 14 years. In 2010, he was appointed bishop and ordained into the episcopacy. Bishop McElroy has written articles for America Magazine and is the author of two books. One, The Search for an American Public Theology, The Contribution of John Courtney Murray, and secondly, Morality and American Foreign Policy, The Role of Ethics in International Affairs. He has taught ethics at St. Patrick's Seminary and at the University of San Francisco. My last point is to share with you that Bishop McElroy is no stranger to Boston College. I learned today that he utilized the Burns Library archives uh, for his senior thesis at Harvard. And, but in more recent year, he's been a really a valued partner and collaborator with the C21 online program, um, implementing uh, faith formation courses for well over a thousand parish leaders in the Archdiocese of San Francisco. We have the honor of having you to campus, and so please join me in welcoming Bishop McElroy. It's a great privilege to be here today, and I've had a, a joyful day today meeting with faculty and students and the leadership of the college, and it's great to be back in Boston and Boston College. I'm hoping to escape tomorrow, and so say a prayer that I am able to do that with the snow about to come in. Um, but I also want to thank, particularly, I want to thank the C21 program and the college as a whole for the great help which they've given to the Archdiocese of San Francisco in helping us uh, with our adult faith formation program. Uh, the college has given its various uh, recorded resources to us for use in adult faith formation has been very productive, very helpful, using the uh, expertise and insights and lectures of the faculty members here 
to help bring a very strong sense of Catholic faith and integration of that faith uh, into our community in San Francisco. So I'm very, very grateful. Now, the topic that I want to talk about today is the challenge of Catholic teaching on war and peace at the present moment here in the United States. Thirty years ago, the Catholic bishops of the United States issued a pastoral letter entitled, The Challenge of Peace. God's promise and our response. And it was a very important event in the life of the church in the United States. It was a bold effort to examine the foreign and military policies of the United States in the clear light of Catholic social teaching. The challenge of peace echoed the voice of the Second Vatican Council in decrying the massive amounts of money which are spent on armaments while the poor of the world suffer in dire poverty. The challenge of peace recognized foreign threats to peace and justice which are present in the world. That is, there is evil in the world. But the letter also criticized the frequency and ease with which the United States resorted to the use of its vast military power to project its will upon foreign nations. The challenge of peace called upon the United States and the Soviet Union to engage in massive reductions together in their nuclear armaments so that the world would not forevermore be faced with the great threat of nuclear annihilation. And most importantly, the challenge of peace 30 years ago proclaimed that war is in inescapably a deeply moral question which left unexplored can erode the very soul of a society which seeks through its military powers to ennoble the world in which we live. Today, we stand amidst the longest period of major warfare in our nation's history. The war in Iraq has ended with a fragile peace and a deeply divided society. The war in Afghanistan continues in its 12th year with no hope of real peace and a planned withdrawal next year that even the most optimistic experts really believe will likely lead to national division or collapse. It is appropriate now to pause and reflect deeply upon the ethical dimensions of the questions that have been raised and continue to be raised by our interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq. It is vital that we as a nation confront ethically the question of what role war is to play in our national life in the coming decade. It is necessary that we take the prism of Catholic social teaching on war and peace and use it to illuminate a moral pathway for the nation in the years to come so that the legacy of the past decade does not become the template for the coming decade. Such an examination must proceed from a profound respect for the service that American men, military men and women, render not only to our nation, but to our world. It must recognize that evil exists in our world and must be resisted. And it must resist the temptation to ignore the complexities that attach to questions of war and peace in the modern era. But such an examination must also proceed from a conviction that the 2,000 year long tradition of Catholic teaching on war and peace offers profound wisdom that while rooted in ages past has much to say in the present moment. What is the Catholic tradition on war and peace? In a very real way, there is no unified tradition on the issue of war and peace. As the challenge of peace noted, the Catholic tradition on war and peace is a long and complex one, reaching from the Sermon on the Mount to the statements of the modern popes. Its development cannot be stretched, sketched in a straight line, and it seldom gives a simple answer to complex questions. It speaks through many voices and has produced multiple forms of religious witness. 
But if it is essential to recognize the complexity of Catholic teaching on war and peace, it is important to note that two main strands of teaching have been most prominent in Catholic thought. The first of these is the pacifist tradition, and the second is the just war tradition, the just war tradition having given the structure to what has become the ethical and international law on war and peace in Western culture. In early Christianity, pacifism dominated the theological and pastoral life of the church. Writers could not comprehend how the Jesus who counseled true love of enemies could ever sanction the systematic taking of human life which is intrinsic to war. While it is true that resisting to serving in the military in the early ages of the church was in part linked to the fact that that involved emperor worship, it is clear that Christian theologians such as Tertullian and Origen believe that the call to discipleship was at its core impossible to reconcile with service in war and support for war. Abundant evidence points to a wide reluctance among Christian disciples to join the military, and St. Cyprian of Carthage noted approvingly that the Christians of his era refused to take up arms in the face of death. Quote, they do not even fight against those who are attacking, since it is not granted to the innocent to kill even the aggressor, but promptly deliver up their souls and blood, unquote. In the history of the church, from the age of the early Christian communities to that of Francis of Assisi, so important in these days, to that of Dorothy Day, heroic men and women have pointed to pacifism as the only truly Christian response to the barbarity of war. This witness is not a passive one. Christian pacifism is not non-resistance. Pacifists are fully committed to fighting evil in the world and make enormous sacrifices in fighting that evil and protecting human rights which are in jeopardy. But they look at the legacy of war in human history and conclude that evil is not defeated but only confirmed by war. Thus, for the Christian pacifist, there is no option but pacifism. After all, how can the parable of the Good Samaritan possibly be reconciled with killing the stranger in war rather than helping him when you come upon him? How indeed? That was the question that St. Augustine wrestled with as he confronted the barbarian invasions. How do you reconcile the parable of the Good Samaritan which says, here the stranger, the foreigner, is your neighbor whom you are called to love and sacrifice for? How can you reconcile that for war, with war? The great Protestant theologian Paul Ramsey pointed out the remarkable way in which Augustine did this. He said, Augustine, think if you were the, the Good Samaritan coming down the road 20 minutes beforehand, when the beating was going on, when the robbers were beating up that man lying by the side of the road. And you came upon that as the Good Samaritan. What then would have been your obligation as a Christian? Augustine says, your obligation would have been to resist the evil and put a stop to the robbers and put a stop to the beating. So too, Augustine concluded, the use of force is at times necessary to defend the lives and the fundamental rights of peoples who are being victimized. From this assertion that the call to love not only tolerates a recourse to war, but at times demands it, Augustine fashioned what came to be the just war tradition. Essentially, the just war tradition is composed of two parts. The 
first is called the us ad bellum, that is, those conditions which are simultaneously necessarily fulfilled before you can morally go to war. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches that there are four such conditions. First, and most importantly, there must be a just cause rooted in the defense of a community or a nation against lasting, grave, and certain attack. I want to repeat that. Against lasting, grave, and certain attack. Secondly, more, war must be a last resort. That is, you must have exhausted every alternative with the reasonable hope of success of ending the evil, ending the attack, without going to war before you can legitimately go to war. Thirdly, there must be serious prospects for success. You must have a hope that by war you can forestall this evil. And finally, the use of arms must not produce evils greater than the evil which will be eliminated. And in the age in which we live, this is a major condition, it's a condition of proportionality. The second part of the, the uh, just war tradition is called the jus in bello. It means what are the rules in war? It means even if you morally can go to war, what are the conditions that you have to observe when you do go to war? The first of the two principles of the law in warfare, the use in bello, is that acts of war cannot be directed against civilians and that efforts must be undertaken to minimize civilian casualties in war. The second principle is that every act of war must be likely to yield greater good than the harm it causes. That's, again, that principle of proportionality applied to every act in war. Taken together, the elements of Catholic just war thinking are meant to embody two countervailing convictions about the realities of modern warfare. First, that war is an enormously evil element of human existence, which is all too alluring for human beings and human societies. And secondly, in very limited circumstances, war constitutes a morally legitimate and even obligatory avenue for the defense of the most fundamental rights of peoples and nations. The just war tradition has reflected Catholic teaching on war and peace for almost 15 centuries. Catholic teaching has concluded in the main that pacifism is a heroic and praiseworthy stance for individual Christians, which must be recognized as the legitimate right of individual citizens and in societies, but that the obligations of nations to defend the people, their people against deadly evil in the world make just war thinking the most appropriate framework for societal decisions on war and peace. Thus, in dealing with this question of pacifism, and the just war tradition, the church has concluded in the main that pacifism is a wonderful, praiseworthy, heroic stance. And individuals are entitled to make that stance and societies must accept that as legitimate. But at the same time, given evil in the world, that societies have a right and sometimes an obligation to defend themselves or defend other victimized nations against grave and direct attack. But if the church has affirmed this notion of just war, it has radically altered the meaning of just war in the past 50 years. And this goes to the heart of this notion of the Catholic intellectual tradition, which this series focuses upon. Because the Catholic intellectual tradition, even one which is as long as the war and peace teaching, it grows, it changes, it matures, because new human realities crop up, especially in areas like this in war, which confront the church and humanity with new moral problems that call for refinements in Catholic teaching. It's a grave mistake to look on Catholic teaching, even one which is as long as that on war and peace, as fixed. Catholic moral teaching develops and grows and renews itself. And in the last 50 years, particularly the teaching on war and peace has grown and renewed itself 
dealing with this issue of war and peace. The church in this period of time has dramatically refined the teaching on war and peace to narrow the gate for the circumstances in which war can be fought. The invention of strategic bombing, the fact that beginning in the 20th century, the battlefield was not a fixed place, but strategic bombing allowed the bombing of homelands and all the massive casualties that came with us. That weighs gravely on the church's analysis of that, and the church says that calls us to narrow the gate. Weapons of mass destruction that portend suffering unimaginable in scale and scope, and the threat that for the first time in human history, humanity possesses weapons capable of ending ex own existence. This calls for a narrowing of the gate. And finally, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Their spread to so many nations now in the world necessitates the sobering calculation that the next recourse to war may easily involve nuclear powers in conflict with one another. Against this backdrop, Catholic moral teaching over the last 50 years has dramatically strengthened the presumption against war. From Pacham and Terrace's assertion in 1962 that it is hardly imaginable that in an atomic era war could be used as an instrument of justice, to Paul VI clarion call to the United Nations, no more war, war never again. To Benedict XVI's questioning whether Amidst the current destructiveness of war, it is even licit to admit of the possibility of just war. The popes of the modern era have said we have to radically strengthen the presumption against war. Specifically, Catholic teaching has narrowed the obligation of nations and has stressed that they must exhaust every possible alternative to war and narrow the scope of the just causes which can legitimately constitute the foundation for recourse to war. It used to be that there was some width to the just cause, that what you could be defending. Now the church is very narrow. It says you have to be defending direct attack, grave attack upon human lives or rights of that gravity. So the church says because war has gotten so more uh, atrocious in its, its consequences that the gate has to be narrowed. In addition, Catholic teaching has consistently raised the gravest possible objections to the arms race in the world and to the theft from the poor which spending on weapons represents in our modern era and in our own nation. Now, what does this have to say for us as a society now, this evolution in Catholic teaching? Just at the time the Catholic teaching and the legitimacy of war in the modern era has been narrowing the grounds for recourse to armed conflict, U.S. policy has sought to expand the scope of war in several key ways. In large part, this expansion has been a reaction to the trauma of 9-11, and the very sobering recognition that the U.S. itself is vulnerable to terrorist attack. This really changed our whole outlook on the world. There is no doubt that the specter of the World Trade Center attack required major changes in how the United States deals with international terrorism. But the policies of the United States in the past decade in reformulating its stance on war have gone far beyond these necessities. In a very real way, the United States has embarked upon a pathway of perpetual war based upon a rejection of fundamental principles of ethics that frame Catholic teaching and international law. For this reason, Catholic teaching on war and peace presents five major challenges to the direction of American foreign policy and war planning at the current moment. First, 
Catholic teaching challenges the United States to reject the principle of preemptive war. There was no attack upon the United States or any other nation by Iraq in 2003. Instead, the American justification for initiating war lay in the perception by American leaders that Saddam Hussein constituted a future military threat against the United States or its allies. The American administration proposed that this remote and unverified danger constitutes sufficient cause to morally initiate war. Such an argument is unacceptable in Catholic moral teaching. The Catechism of the Catholic Church insists that a nation can only go to war to meet damage inflicted by an aggressor which must be lasting, grave, and certain. That can't be before the attack occurs. There had been no grave damage inflicted upon the U.S. or any other nation by Iraq in 2003. There was no certainty that Iraq had the ability to inflict grave harm in 2003. Catholic social teaching clearly demands that a nation go to war only in response to a specific and evident aggression, not in response to speculations about possible attacks in future months or years. The adoption of preemption by American policymakers in 2003 was a serious departure in American war planning and is utterly incompatible with Catholic doctrine precisely because recent papal teaching has sought to narrow the grounds for recourse to war, while the doctrine of preemption massively expands those grounds. As the U.S. grapples with the complex dilemmas of Iran and North Korea at these present moments, it should reject the notion of preemptive war as a legitimate option. Secondly, Catholic teaching challenges the United States to reject the use of war to transform societies and political structures of other nations. Much of the momentum for launching the war in Iraq lay in the desire of American policymakers to make Iraq an experiment in democracy in the Middle East. And the goal of democratizing Iran, I'm sorry, of Afghanistan, has been pivotal in extending the war in that devastated land for more than a decade. Catholic teaching on war and peace rejects the notion that a nation can go to war in order to transform the political structures of other lands, even when the goal of that transformation is as laudable as democratization. One of the lasting lessons of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan is that the use of military force is ill-equipped to build democracy. Number three. Catholic teaching challenges the U.S. to curtail its expansionist trend in drone warfare. Unmanned aerial systems, more commonly known as drones, constitute an alluring new tool for war by the United States. Drones offer a weapon system which is capable of hovering around a target for long periods, does not require a pilot, and can be retargeted very quickly. Thus, it is in many ways an ideal weapon for targeting terrorism and terrorists. And for that reason, drones have become an increasingly prominent component of the American arsenal. But drones also pose an ominous potential to greatly expand the reality of war in the coming generation, precisely because their use eviscerates so many of the limitations posed by the just war tradition. First of all, armed drones are designed specifically to produce non-battlefield deaths. Secondly, their use invites a blurring of the very distinction between civilian and soldiers, which is crucial to the just war tradition. While early drone use in the Bush administration focused on specific terrorist attacks and targets, President Obama has accepted the use of, quote, signature strikes, which target individuals or groups based on their behavior patterns rather than our identities. In other words, in our policy now, 
we target through drones the killing of individuals, not on the basis of specifically who they are, because we've identified who they are, but rather what their behavior is, that it is suspicious in ways that are linked to patterns uh, exhibited often by those who are involved in terrorist acts. The U.S. counts all military-age males in the strike zone as combatants unless there is specific intelligence that later proves them innocent. In other words, for this purpose, you're guilty till innocent. There is increasing evidence that the majority of those killed in such signature attacks are not involved in international terrorism, but rather represent individuals involved in domestic insurgencies or civilians with no involvement. The U.S. is now standing at the threshold of its use of drone warfare. Drones originally were, for us, a way of getting intelligence. It's a wonderful way of getting intelligence. But as a weapon system, there is a tremendous potential for it becoming something that is a whole new way of warfare that is very destructive of peace in the world. The present course of the United States is to expand the use of drones with ever-increasing targets. But the dangers of such a trajectory are profound. There are increasing signs that drone, drone use provokes fear and anger among the population of targeted countries. This, in turn, undermines the very core of American policy. In other words, the resentments of people who are subjected to drone warfare in general in their territory, those resentments grow their increasing indications when drone use is used over a long period of time. International polling demonstrates widespread resentment of U.S. drone warfare among many of America's most important allies. And one of the important things is in drone warfare is this. We can't launch them from aircraft carriers, therefore we need land bases. If our allies in the area won't allow us to do that because the perception of drone warfare is so bad, we're going to be in big trouble for drones altogether. Next, drones are relatively inexpensive weapon systems. More than 60 nations already have non-weaponized drones. And the allure of a weapon capable of killing off the battlefield may well produce a wholly new and insidious form of international warfare. Thirdly, the use of drones breaks down the barrier between war and peace. Thus, it invites an increase in the frequency of war. Because when we're using war, are we at war or are we at peace? Catholic teaching on war raises several core objections to the pathway of drone warfare. First, it would reject the notion of signature strikes. Be such as such policy is incapable of preserving the principle of non-combatant immunity, that distinction between civilians and soldiers. Secondly, Catholic teaching would view the systematic violations of national sovereignty that are absolutely inherent in drone warfare as an invitation to further armed resistance and revolution. Finally, the current expansiveness and secrecy of American drone policy is likely to produce a world in which many nations develop drone systems which they utilize in a similarly non-transparent <coughs> manner to threaten the security and serenity of other peoples near them. The ethical judgment about drone warfare should be rendered not envisioning a world where only the United States has drones, but rather envisioning a world where every nation has drones. Fourthly, Catholic teaching challenges the U.S. to launch a renewed effort to reduce nuclear weapons around the world and end nuclear proliferation. In the years following the challenge of peace in 1983, there were dramatic reductions in the, in the nuclear weapons capacities of the United States and the Soviet Union. But in recent years, that progress has all but disappeared. Moreover, new nations every year are attaining the capacity to build and use nuclear weapons. 
It is against this backdrop, the complacency we have now developed about nuclear weapons and proliferation, that Pope Benedict in the World Peace Day message of 2008 called for a radical renewal of the universal commitment to limiting and ultimately eliminating nuclear weapons in the world. Former Pope Benedict, uh, when I was first doing this, writing this, it was Pope Benedict. Now it's former Pope Benedict. He wrote, in difficult times such as these, it is truly necessary for all people of goodwill to come together to reach concrete agreements aimed at effective demilitarization, especially in the area of nuclear arms. At a time when the process of nuclear nonproliferation is at a standstill, I feel bound to entreat those in authority to resume with greater determination negotiations for a progressive and mutually agreed dismantling of existing nuclear weapons. In renewing this appeal, I know that I am echoing the desire of all those concerned for the future of humanity. Four years ago, American foreign policy veterans led by former Secretaries of State George Shultz, Henry Kissinger, and James Baker launched an international campaign to radically focus on nuclear disarmament. Advances in weapons and information technologies have now produced the possibility for the first time in the nuclear age that nuclear weapons could be virtually eliminated in the world without increasing the vulnerability of either the two superpowers in terms of nuclear weapons, the United States and the Soviet Union, the other major nuclear powers, or the non-nuclear powers. A priority in weapons development and planning for a central goal of every Catholic treatment of war in the period of 1945 has been the actual elimination of nuclear arsenals. New technologies have allowed us to come where that is close to being a realistic option if we move on this priority. For most of this period, this goal has been only a dream. Now it is a real possibility. And the church has said to us, we must take it off the back burner and put it on the front burner. Finally, Catholic teaching challenges the US to reduce its defense spending. The United States not only spends more on defense than any other nation on earth, it spends more in real dollar terms than every other nation on earth combined. The Pentagon budget has doubled in terms of real dollars since 1998. It is now higher at real dollar terms than at virtually any point since World War II. This year, the United States will spend $600 billion on defense in addition to the costs of the war in Afghanistan and in addition to retirement costs for military personnel. This is this expenditure is 50% higher than the combined discretionary spending for all other programs. Education, housing, health, poverty reduction, infrastructure, commerce, and law enforcement taken together. Defense spending is twice what goes into those categories. It is 25 times that the amount the US spends on foreign true economic assistance. What are the implications of these budgeting realities for the poor of the world? The UN Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that $24 billion per year in additional official development assistance to the poorest nations of the world would cut world hunger in half in 15 years. What would this accomplish? 12 million deaths per year of children under five in the developing world are strongly associated with malnutrition. 150 million children in developing countries suffer from protein energy malnutrition. More than 800 million people are hungry and malnourished. All of these things would be cut in half by $24 billion a year. And we spend $600 billion a year in the core Pentagon budget. Even with the sequestration it remains enormously 
more than the other programs I've just been describing. The church has consistently pointed to the enormous theft from the poor constituted by the buildup of modern weapon systems and defense expenditures. As Gaudium et Spes noted prophetically, as long as extravagant sums of money are poured into the development of new weapons, it is impossible to devote adequate aid to tackling the misery which prevails in the present day in the world. Therefore, we declare once again, the arms race is one of the greatest curses of the human race, and the harm it inflicts on the poor is more than it can be endured. I sometimes think to myself, we are very blessed to live in this country, which we do, and our country has done so much good. But at the same time, I sometimes think on the last judgment in the Gospel of Matthew, and when Jesus said to us, you know, I was poor, and I was hungry, and I was in need, we as a nation will have to say, but Lord, we had to buy more weapons. Catholic intellectual tradition on war and peace supports the right and obligation of nations to defend themselves from serious aggression. But in a world where weapons of war being, bring increased casualties and human misery, Catholic teaching has narrowed the ethical gate for recourse to war. As the U.S. examines the role of war in its national policy for the coming decade, it is vital that ethical questions be raised and faced in a penetrating manner. For America of all nations places its foreign policy not only within a framework of attaining its national interests, but in doing so in a manner which ennobles the world as a whole. It is difficult for any nation to do this. It is harder still for the world's most powerful nation militarily to do this. But in wrestling with the challenges of Catholic teaching on war and peace, our nation's goals will only be made more attainable and more humane. Thank you very much.